conversation with the candidate continues. All right, thanks for clicking on our extended conversation with Congressman John Delaney and our studio audience of New Hampshire voters here. We're going to get right into 30 full minutes of questions, commercial free, and we're going to start with Joan Krimlisk. Thank you. <coughs> Welcome to New Hampshire. Um, nice to see you, Joan. <laughs> how would you secure the southern border um, so that illegal cargo and um, undocumented people cannot come across the border? So the first thing I would do to secure our southern border is talk to experts. Right? I don't think politicians should be making this decision. I think we should have experts making the decision. And I think if you talk to experts, this is what they tell you. What we should do mostly is have technology solutions. Right? Technology solutions, particularly across parts of our border that are incredibly environmentally sensitive, are much more effective, not only cost effective, but actually effective than building barriers. So things like high-powered cameras, utilizing drones, things like that, can secure most of our borders in an incredibly cost-effective and effective manner in terms of, you know, uh, monitoring what's going on the border. We probably need more personnel, right, at certain parts, particularly at ports of entry, where a lot of illegal drugs are coming in, right, where we need more technology as well, and probably in certain places a barrier, right? So I think if we got a bunch of experts around the table and we said, hey, we want to spend this, the following amount of money, how should we do it? I think they'd come back with a combination of technology solutions, maybe some barriers in a couple of spots, and more personnel. They'd have a focus on ports of entry, I think, because that's where most of the problem is right now. Right, if you look at where illegal drugs are coming through, they're coming through ports of entry. Right, so that's where we need to make more investments. So as president, as someone who cares about ensuring that our borders are secure, I would do the smart thing. And the smart thing is to talk to experts, get their recommendations. For example, I talked to a company that's running a pilot along the border using technology, high-powered cameras and drones, right? In their part of the border where they're running the pilot, crossings are down 95%. They believe they can install that whole system across the border for $200 million, right? So that's what you do if you actually don't use the border as a political issue and you're actually trying to do the right thing, use the taxpayer money as wisely as possible and actually secure our border. That's what I would do as president. Thank you. Okay, next up is a social media question. You're attracting some attention from Republicans here. State Rep Jess Edwards of Auburn, not sure if this is a fastball, a curveball, or a softball here. He says, how great a job do you think President Trump is doing? <coughs> Which camera do I look at, first of all, when I answer <laughs> yeah, the question? Go ahead, yeah, take it away. Yeah. Got it. So, um, <clears throat> I don't think President Trump is doing a good job at all. And the, the main reason I think he's doing a terrible job is because I think he lacks a moral compass. And he's indecent. Right? I think what the American people deserve is a president who actually operates with a moral compass and is decent right? and, and projects a sense of respect and civility and honor to the office of the presidency. I also think he doesn't tell the truth. I mean, I'm very different than the current president, and I just don't mean the hairline. I have a plan for the future, which I don't believe he does. I think he wants to turn the clock backwards. Right? I bring people together. I spent my whole career bringing people together. I think he's a divider. I think he wakes up every day and tries to figure out how to divide the American people. And I think what a president should do is wake up every day and effectively swear never to divide the American people and to do whatever they can to bring the American people together. And I don't think he's honest with the American people and I promise to always tell you the truth. So those kind of attributes of who he is as a person that's what I actually think is the worst side of him. Now, I don't agree with his policy. Some of his policies I, I have less issue with. Right? I think his approach to North Korea, while I was very worried about the outcome he might negotiate, I don't think it's bad to engage. I know he's been criticized around, you know, why you're meeting with him and all that kind of stuff. I think engagement is fine. So I'm not someone who wakes up every day and says everything he does is wrong. But I think the biggest problem with him as our leader is he doesn't have the values that we as Americans hold so dear and that we need our leader to project every day to us. We need a unifier. We need someone who tells the truth, right? Someone who's gonna stand up for hate, right? Someone who's gonna try to do everything they possibly can to restore a sense of common purpose to who we are as a people and someone who has a moral compass. And I don't think he has any of those things. Our next question comes from William Fortune. Morning. Morning, William. 
France has had one of the lowest carbon footprints of any industrial nation for many years. What will you do to get the United States designed greenhouse gas free, economical, walk away safe, factory built electric generating plants brought back from countries like China and built in New Hampshire so we can power the world with clean electricity? All right, good question. So I'm call let me tell you what my goal is, <clears throat> right? My goal is to have net zero emissions by 2050. That's a goal that the United States can achieve. We can achieve that with respect to the electrical grid earlier than that, right? We can get to net zero on the electrical grid much sooner than that. But I want it for the whole country, net zero by 2050. And the United States of America is, is the country that is in the best position to do it of any country in the world. We have the resource portfolio that you need to do this. So let me tell you what my plan is to do that. First thing I want to do in my first year as president is pass a carbon tax. Very similar to the bipartisan carbon tax bill I introduced in the Congress, right, which is the only bipartisan bill. And I believe I can get that done with every Democrat and all the coastal Republicans. That will cut carbon emissions by 90% and have a particular uh, focus on the electrical industry, obviously, because that's what the carbon tax will really get at right away. It's bipartisan, puts, it puts a price on carbon, takes all the money we raise and give it back to the American people. So it's called a carbon tax dividend structure. That's the first thing. The second thing I want to do is part of a national infrastructure plan, build a lot of weather resilient infrastructure, because we're going to have to deal with the effects of climate. The third thing I want to do is increase the Department of Energy research budget by fivefold, right? Because we need new innovation around storage technologies and energy transmission technologies. We need a whole new electric grid in this country and we need some more innovation to make it happen. And then the fourth thing I want to do is create a market for companies that run negative emissions technologies to actually get paid to take carbon out of the atmosphere. These technologies exist right now. The problem is they're way too expensive. But if we actually create a market for these things, what these things are are basically machines that take carbon out of the atmosphere Right? And then they, then they put the carbon back in the earth. And the technologies exist, but they're really expensive. But wind and solar used to be really expensive as well. But what did we do? We created a market for them through tax credits. And then the private economy started innovating. And the cost in wind and solar have come way down. I want to do the same thing for negative emissions technologies, which are not talked a lot about as part of the solution. But in many ways, they're, they're what we need to get to net zero by 2050. So I have a plan, it's very specific, it's got kind of four aspects to it, carbon tax, resilient infrastructure, more research in storage and transmission, and creating a market for uh, negative emission technologies. I believe those four things working together will allow the United States of America across the next 20 or 30 years to replace our entire energy kind of infrastructure, if you will, with renewables and other technologies to get us to net zero. Thank you, sir. Thank you, William. We've got another social media question coming in. Jeanette Moran asks, what are you going to do to help disabled people who can't afford their rent? <clears throat> well, affordable housing is a crisis right now in the United States of America, right? It's a crisis. It's happening in a lot of communities that have had really good economic growth, actually, right? So it's kind of the other side of the coin of having a really good economy. You know, so you see it in places like Seattle where workers are driving three hours right, to get to work because they can't afford to live anywhere near the city. But it's also happening in other communities. And it's happening uh, particularly for people who are, uh, are suffering or, or not suffering, but have a disability. And so one of the things I've called for is a very significant increase in the amount of money that goes towards affordable housing. So I introduced a bipartisan bill that reforms our housing finance system. And again, it's bipartisan. You'll hear me say that a lot because I actually want to get things done. And if you look back over our history, the only way we got anything done is when we came together. And so what my bill does is basically reform housing finance, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all those things which need reform. And as part of that reform, it creates billions of dollars a year for affordable housing, which we're going to give to the all 50 states for them to effectively distribute the way they think makes the most sense. And programs where we need it are to put more money behind programs with, that help Americans with disability and their housing. So that's one of the plans I have around that issue. 
Next question is from Carolyn Moore. Hello, Hi. Carol. Carol or Carolyn? Carolyn. Carolyn. Yes. Uh, you, you brought this up a little earlier, but mine's on Medicaid Part D. And it prohibits us negotiating our prices. If that's repealed so that you can nego negotiate prices, how will that affect the rest of Part D? Well, <clears throat> so that's why you, you got to think about this holistically. And what I mean by that is, uh, think about what I said happens around the world. So you got the world, mm -hmm. and pharmaceuticals get sold all over the world. And if in a bunch of countries they cap the prices at really low prices, then what the pharmaceutical companies do is they raise them everywhere else to make their profit margins. And so you can't just solve one part of the issue because all they do is raise the prices. So if we just allowed the government to negotiate Medicare drug prices, which I'm 100% for, then inevitably pharmaceutical prices are going to go up somewhere else. So that's why we also have to think of this holistically. That's why I think it's a global issue. Right? That's why, as, as a president, one of the things I want to do is basically either through trade and tariffs or by doing something very simple, which is to propose a tax. And this is how the tax would work. We're going to tax pharmaceutical companies at 100% of the difference between where they sell drugs here and where they sell them in the G20. So if they're selling a drug for $30 in the G20, again, those are the wealthy countries in the world, and they're selling it for $100 here, then that $70 gets taxed at 100%. Now, they're not going to want to pay that tax, so you know what they're going to do? They're going to raise the prices there and lower them here. So there's no difference. But that's the kind of stuff I'm thinking about, because you're right. If we lower prices one place, it may not affect it anywhere else. So you have to think of it across the board. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Next question comes from Becca Budrock. Hey, Hi, Becca. Congressman Delaney. Thank you very much uh, for being here today. Uh, I'm an environmental science student, so environmental issues are really near and dear to my heart. So my question for you is, what are your plans to increase the availability of local food across the country? It's a great issue. Uh, and, it's, and it's an issue that most of the American people are behind you on, right? Because if you think about the growth, and I represented a district in Maryland that had a lot of small family farms, right? And a lot of these farms were about an hour or two hours outside of Washington, D.C. So this was an issue that they really cared about because they had a huge opportunity to be delivering their food fresh to market to this big city with all this demand. So I think we need, you know, we need policies, uh, farm policies, really, that support these kind of people. I mean, with the technologies we have now, which you're probably aware of, the amount of sustainable farming we can do in urban settings, right? It, it's just, it's transformative, right? It's changing how we, we think about farming. And you, you, we see it all over New Hampshire here. So I'm in favor of policies that support that type of sustainable development because it's not only results in healthier food, it's all the kind of food we all want to eat, but it actually gets to climate change. Right? Because one of the big issues with the agricultural industry, is opposed, in addition to kind of how things are farmed, et cetera, is a lot of the transportation stuff that's associated with it that has a very big carbon footprint. So I think it's great. I think it's a really exciting trend in this country right now. And, it, and it's wonderful that so many consumers are interested in it because that's what really creates the opportunity for it to grow. Great question. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. We've got another social media co uh, question coming in. This one from Instagram and user Maple60. Uh, uh, this uh, user asks, what does he see as his number one priority for the country? <clears throat> well, the, my number one priority for the country is to try to bring us back together, right, because we're so divided. I think the central issue facing this country is how terribly divided we are as a people, right? And you hear it everywhere, right? You, you have it in your own private conversations when you're at a coffee shop or at you know, at work or at school, the divisions have become so deep in this country that they're literally tearing us apart. So I think we need a president that actually wants to bring us together. And I got some specific ideas as to how we do that. Right? The first thing is when I'm inaugurated, I want to look out the American people and say, I represent every one of you, whether you voted for me or not. And to prove it, in my first hundred days, my priority is going to be these following five or six things. Right? This is in the first three months. The whole tone of the presidency in many ways is determined by the first three months. I'm going to have five or six existing bills in the Congress that deal with big things. Climate, my carbon tax bill. I want to double the earned income tax credit, which is the most successful anti-poverty program we have in this country. I want to build infrastructure. 
right? I want to fix our criminal justice system and I want to do immigration reform. Those five priorities, there's good ideas in the Congress right now that are bipartisan. Wouldn't it be amazing if a president looked out the American people and said, in my first 100 days, I'm going to focus on things we agree with each other on. I'm going to focus on things we agree with each other on. And I've taken bills that exist in the Congress that your good-minded Democrats and Republicans have worked on for years. And that's going to be my agenda. And we're going to get those done. And we're going to prove to the American people that we can start working again. And then I want to reform government. I want to take on too much money in politics. I want to take on gerrymandering. I want to take on voter suppression things that kind of bend the will of the democracy away from the American people. And then I'm also calling for national service. Right? As I said to the gentleman when we talked about um, college affordability, one of the things I want to do is have a national service program, not mandatory, but really an exciting program where kids can serve their country. It'll bring us together. It'll be something we're proud of, and it'll help that generation of young Americans. So that's my proposal. Quick follow-up there, Congressman. You mentioned wanting to pass these bills that exist in Congress already. Uh, Why have they not passed so far? You know, as someone who's running on the fundamental premise that we actually have to start doing things, right? Because if you look back what's happened in this country, it's really pretty simple. The world's changed rapidly because of technology and globalization. And we didn't prepare our citizens for it which is why so many people have been left behind. And why didn't we prepare our citizens for it? Because we stopped doing things. We haven't updated our public education system, right? I mean, I did a round table here in Portsmouth talking to teachers about the additional burdens they have as teachers in 2019, right? They're not just dealing with what happens in the classroom, they're dealing with so many other things. We haven't updated that. We haven't updated our environmental policies to deal with climate change. Right, I did a round table here in New Hampshire talking about that. Right, we haven't dealt with our health care system. I mean, my dad was a union electrician. He had one job for 60 years. It made sense to have your health care tied to your job. But I think one of my four daughters, one of them may have 10 jobs. You shouldn't have your health care tied to your job. Imagine your car insurance tied to your job. It's a crazy system. So in many ways, the genius of America was that we allowed capitalism historically to do its magic, creates jobs and innovate. But we moderated it with tax policy, regulation, workers' rights, and societal infrastructure that was built so that the American people had a shot. We stopped doing all that. And so we got to get back to doing things. And the reason these things haven't gotten done is because people put their political party ahead of their country. They care more about partisanship. And we need a president who's actually running on this philosophy of leadership, which is to find common ground and get things done. And then we can start getting some of these things done. Next question comes from Clara Monier. Good morning, Representative. As you can see by my hair, I'm a senior citizen. And I'm concerned about the Social Security system. Um, Some organizations have been predicting that it will reduce its benefits by 2035. Yes. Do you see this is a problem, and how would you solve it since you're proposing yourself as a problem solver? Well, it is a problem. It's not as big of a problem as people like to scare you into thinking. But it is a problem. And I actually, again, kind of coming back to this theme of kind of working together, I have the only bipartisan bill in the Congress that actually deals with it, with a gentleman named Tom Cole, a, a great Republican from Oklahoma. He and I have a bill to extend the solvency of Social Security by 75 years. So just coming back to Social Security, I mean, Social Security is is maybe the greatest anti-poverty program we've had as a country. When it was put in place, 50% of our seniors lived in poverty. Today, it's about 10%. It's fantastic, right? It's a fantastic program. But across time, we've always made adjustments to it. Why did we do that? Because it's basically social insurance. It's not an entitlement program. People pay into it like an insurance program, and then they get money out. Right, but as, we've, as things have changed, as people have lived longer and the ratio of people working to, in retirement have changed, we've made adjustments. The last time we did that was in the early 80s. Right? Back then we had a very similar situation. And the poverty rate of seniors was 20%. We adjust, made adjustments. They extended the solvency for 50 years on a bipartisan basis, and the poverty rate of our seniors has been cut from 20 to 10% which proves we can actually strengthen Social Security and not hurt the program. So again, it's not as big of a problem as people think, right? Because historically, Social Security is still solvent. 
But on an annual basis, what's starting to happen is more money is getting paid out than is being taken in. And by, as you said, 2030 to 2035, then it actually becomes insolvent. And by law, they have to cut benefits to make it solvent. They project that cut to be 25%, which is ridiculous. It's immoral. We can never do that. We can't just wake up and cut the benefits of our seniors by 25%. So we have to deal with it now. The sooner we deal with it, the better. The sooner we deal with it, the easier. And like most things, I've stepped forward, found common ground, and have a plan to extend the solvency for 75 years because I want to push this out to the next century. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Next question comes from Richard Savory. Hello, Thank Richard. You. Hi, Mr. Delaney. Um, I grew up in a family of Kennedy-style Democrats. Yep. My dad my, and my whole family. Nowadays, all you hear is all kinds of socialist ideals, and all the politicians they see me running have all these socialist uh, you know, programs they want to put out. Where are the real Democrats running for office so we can get our party back to where we work for the people? Well, here's one of them. And I mean, to some extent, this discussion about socialism versus capitalism is a real distraction. Because pure socialism, right, in its pure form, which is government controlling production, is a terrible idea. And it's the wrong answer to every question. But if you really look at the United States of America historically, we've been a capitalistic country with strong social programs. And that's all we got to do. That's what we got to get back to. I mean, capitalism is the greatest innovation and job creation machine ever. And it is the reason the United States is the strongest nation in the world. But we always, as I said, moderated capitalism, right? Because left to its own devices, it's highly disruptive. We moderated capitalism with appropriate tax policy, right? Make, having a tax code that's fair, appropriate regulations, making sure workers have rights, and by building societal infrastructure. Social security is societal infrastructure. Public education is societal infrastructure. Medicare is societal infrastructure. And what's happened over the last 20 years is we stopped doing that stuff. We've been fighting, we haven't done anything, and so there's been too much disruption caused by kind of capitalism being unchecked, if you will. So my solution is not to get rid of capitalism. That's a terrible idea. And replace it with socialism, that's a disaster. But what we should do is make capitalism more just and inclusive. And the way you do that is with tax policy, regulations, and importantly, societal infrastructure. I want to build the public education system for the next century. Right? I want to build the healthcare system for the next century. I mean, I was at Elliott Hospital a couple weeks ago. right? walking around and hearing about what it's like to be running a community hospital these days, right? There's things we got to do. And that's what my presidency is about. It's much more consistent with the kind of worldview that President Kennedy had. You know, President Kennedy in 1958 gave a speech in Baltimore, Maryland, where he said, we shouldn't seek the Republican answer. We shouldn't seek the Democratic answer. We should seek the right answer. We shouldn't refight the battles of the past. We should own our responsibility for the future. And that's my approach. Let's find the right answer, right, no matter where it comes from. Let's bring people together and let's focus on building the future. And we don't have to throw out the model that's made this country great. We just have to update it for the world we live in today. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Richard, thank you. We have another social media great. question coming in. This one from Nate Michaels on tax policy. He asks, what is the exact percentage you would consider a fair share? I always hear about not paying my fair share. I would like to know what that is. Well, let me tell you the part, it, you said Nate, right? Nate. Nate, let me tell you the part of our tax code that's not fair. And that is that if you invest money for a living, in many cases you pay about half in your tax rate as people who work for a living. That's not fair. That to me is the biggest loophole in our tax system. I would definitely be in favor of rolling back the tax cuts for high earners that this last Republican tax cut bill put forth. No question about it. But if you really want to address structural unfairness in the tax code, it's not by just raising rates. It's by doing something called the Buffett Rule, named after Warren Buffett. And what Warren Buffett said, very simple, he goes, why is my tax rate half my assistance tax rate? He goes, why does that make sense? 
And he's right. So what Warren Buffett proposed is that people who invest for a living, like him and so many other people in this country, particularly as wealth become more concentrated, and they live off investments and earnings. They don't live off wages. They live off investments and huge investments. They pay a capital gains rate that's a lot lower than what workers pay. And that's not fair. So Nate, that's what I'm gonna target. There's a lot of money there, and that'll create a more fair society. Because I think people who work for a living shouldn't pay more in tax than people who invest for a living. Okay, uh, our next question comes from Leonard Morrill. Uh, and after this, Congressman Delaney, you've got about three minutes to answer. We'll, we'll stop against our full hour. Good morning. A lot of it you've already answered, but uh, for Medicare for All, how much do you think it will actually cost and how do you propose to pay for it? I don't support Medicare for All. And uh, the reason I don't support it is not only do we not have a way to pay for it, but it's bad policy. And again, a big part of my campaign is being honest about the problems and honest about the solutions. So right now, Medicaid, which is the largest program, pays 80% of costs. So if you go to Elliott Hospital and you say, what, what, how does Medicaid pay you? They're like, well, they don't pay our costs. We take the patients because we are a community hospital. Medicare, very successful program, pays 95% of cost. Commercial insurance pays 115% of cost. So there's no evidence that if the government was the only payer of the bills, that it would ever pay cost. And that would lead to worse quality health care and limited access. So again, if you go to Elliott Hospital and say, what'd you get paid last year for Medicare for the same procedure as compared to commercial insurance? They'd say half. I say, well, what if you, all your bills were paid at that Medicare rate? A lot of hospitals would close. So that's why I favor a universal health care system where everyone gets health care as a right, but they can opt out and get private insurance or buy supplementals. And I got a plan to fully pay for that by, by eliminating the corporate deductibility of health care. See, that's smart health care policy. And it gives everyone universal health care. It's not Medicare for all, which I think is bad policy for the reasons I just talked about. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a little bit of time left. Uh, you've been all over this country. I'm very curious. As you campaign in all 50 states, what's the most interesting place you've been so far that you've said, gosh, I want to come back here again, maybe when I'm not a candidate? Well, I'll tell you, I, I'm getting a hint here. <laughs> Somebody should say New Hampshire. Yeah. You don't, ha don't feel obligated. <laughs> well, New Hampshire is obviously one of the most interesting places I've been to and one of the most beautiful places I've been to. But I got to say, I was in Detroit uh, a couple of, of uh, maybe a month and a half ago. I was driving my dad's truck. My dad was a union electrician. He had a pickup truck his whole life. He passed away two years ago. And I drove his truck out to a trip I was doing to Iowa. And I stopped in Detroit, and I met with a group called the Entrepreneurs of Color, which were minority entrepreneurs operating businesses in some of the worst neighborhoods of Detroit. And as a former entrepreneur, I started two companies. I took them public. I was the youngest CEO on the New York Stock Exchange. I, I love spending time with entrepreneurs. And I got to say, so there were 52 Small businesses started by this Entrepreneur of Color Fund in the worst neighborhoods of Detroit. 51 of them were successful out of 52. So I was like, well, they got a pretty good special sauce here. So I said I would come. I, I actually, when I walked out, I said, I have to come back here because I got to get a better understanding of what you're doing. But I actually think entrepreneurship is... Uh, is one of the most important things in our country right now. And so part of my campaign is about going around the country and finding the best ideas to help create more entrepreneurs, including here in New Hampshire. But I gotta say, as far as beauty is concerned, you can't beat this state. And I'm gonna go to all 50 states. I've pledged to go to all 50 states because I think a president should campaign everywhere. I've, I've been to all 50 states in my life, but as part of my campaign, I've been to about 20. So I'm gonna do the next 30 in the next year. But I gotta say, I was here a couple weeks ago and I was driving, you had a snowstorm. And we were just driving around, and I was taking pictures and, and sending it to my team. I was like, it doesn't get better than campaigning in New Hampshire after, with some fresh snow on the ground. So, yep. Well over 200 towns in this state. And as the late, great Senator John McCain once said, each town is its own political universe. So well, you do, a have a, you do have a very unique political system here. Someone here didn't trust government, <laughs> right? Because, I mean, they created a system that has a lot of checks and balances. Let's put it that way. Okay. Congressman John Adam, Delaney, thank we you. greatly appreciate this conversation. It was wonderful. Thank you all for being thank here. Thank you, and thank you to our audience, and thank you for watching online and on our mobile app. We'll be back next week with Pete Buttigieg. Thank you. Great job, guys.
Any other questions?